You're listening to The Monday American, the show that puts the story back into history. Making history come alive, one episode at a time. The show made for the people, by the people. Visit themondayamerican.com to get more. Dive into the Monday American. Don't worry, we'll be gentle. Thank you for listening to the Monday American Podcast. If you would like to support the show, you can do so by becoming a patron on our Patreon page, which you can get to by the link in the show notes, as well as the official website at themondayamerican.com, or by visiting patreon.com forward slash mondayamerican. And in addition to the Patreon website, you can also get your official Monday American merchandise through the Tee Public store. You can get the logo for the podcast on t-shirts, mugs, stickers, your child. I guess we can tattoo them for you if you want. You can go to that store by going to the website at themondayamerican.com and clicking on merch. And a portion of your sale goes towards the support and future of the podcast. I hope you enjoy part two of the Korean War. Thanks for listening. You're listening to The Monday American. Welcome to the second installment of the Korean War series here on the show. Thanks for listening, guys. I know that the first part of this series was not exactly a short, lighthearted, easy listening episode, and I didn't want it to be. And I believe the reason I didn't want it to be a breezy little easy listening piece was fairly apparent as to why. All that said, if we pick up the story where we left off in the last episode, the United States and United Nations troops are responding to a, what is for all intents and purposes, a surprise attack launched by the North Korean army, sanctioned and supplied by the Soviet Union, as well as some Chinese aid that's sprinkled in to be the cherry on top. And just when the South Korean army, which was ineffective to say the least as far as a resistance force, seemed to be on the very literal brink of collapse, General Douglas MacArthur lands the Marines at Incheon. And it resulted in a genuinely masterful bit of strategical planning And the UN and US forces wound up cutting off the North Korean army supply lines, and suddenly they're at Incheon flanking the invading communist force. Now, at this point of the story, what I should be accounting of is a story of military might cutting off and defeating the surrounded North Korean army fairly easily. Now, my tone there should indicate that what happened at this point moving forward was not that, and it wasn't that by a long shot. And it's truly remarkable as to the actions, the pride, the hubris, and the men behind the entire reason as to why and how it ended up actually playing out. I guess I should go ahead and say as a forewarning, if you're a big fan of Douglas MacArthur, I don't think you're going to enjoy this episode very much because although I am a overtly, uh, you know, America, Team America Hooray, yeah, PBR, in uh, a lot of my other episodes, I do allow that bias to show at times in World War II and Vietnam series, to name a few. I will happily and readily lay the blame when it belongs to an egotist such as General Douglas MacArthur. And now he isn't alone in his blame, but he's the leader of this debacle that by no small measure whatsoever led to the American three-decade-long tragedy in Southeast Asia. Now, I could be accused of pointing my finger too enthusiastically at MacArthur and ignoring the others, but without the actions of him, who was a World War II general and and a good military leader at that, that said, without the actions of MacArthur specifically, this whole ordeal would have played out quite differently. It would have been a much brighter ending to the story, supposedly. Can't really know for sure because you can't revise history. I can guarantee you it would have been a lot less bloodier than it turned out to be. And one of those actions that MacArthur took was actually 
a kind of a lack of an action. It was a warning sign that he didn't heed. It was intel that he ignored, and it was a decision to construct this reality of his desire and choose to allow that to overshadow the actual situation on the ground. And in this case, that was a mistake that allowed a small war to become a much larger war. So in Korea, there's almost, it's almost like two different wars. You have the initial attack from the North Koreans to begin with, and then you have the second part, the larger part of the war, which is marked after the Incheon landings when the United States and the UN forces move past the 38th parallel north to the Chinese-Manchurian border in North Korea, and when the Chinese attack. It's almost like two different wars. And if you're wondering why the last episode was so long, that's kind of why I made it so long. I wanted to make sure that that first part covered that kind of the first section of the war, or the first mini-war within the war, I guess you could say. And now we're picking up with the U.S. moving north past the 38th parallel and General MacArthur leading the way from Tokyo. And at this point of the story, the United States forces had just reached Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea. And when MacArthur went there, he went straight there. He got off his Jeep and he said, quote, Any celebrities here to greet me? Where is Kim Bucktooth? He was mocking in reference to Kim Il-sung, the seemingly defeated North Korean leader. And in front of the 8th Army that was there in the 8th Cavalry, he asked anyone in the cavalry who had been with the unit from the beginning to step forward. And of the roughly 200 men in front of him, only four of them stepped forward, and each of them had been wounded at some point. Afterwards, MacArthur got back on his plane for the flight back to Tokyo. He did not spend the night in Korea, and in fact, he did not spend the night there during the entire time he commanded in the Korean War. And I made a point to say that in the last episode, and I'm making another point to say it now. That's a massive, massive choice that he made that I think goes a little bit over overlooked because of the whole the nature of this war. A leader cannot lead if he's not there. If you think about Eisenhower during World War II, he was always just behind the front lines moving along with his men. He wasn't in Paris when the army was in in the Ardennes fighting the Battle of the Bulge. He wasn't far behind. MacArthur was nowhere near the actual fighting, and there's something that does get lost in translation if you're leading your men and you're not there on the ground to understand what the fight is actually like. And that's one big characterization of this war is the dichotomy of the Tokyo command and the command in Korea. There were it was like there were two different commands. And so MacArthur and the men on his staff were somewhat wonderfully removed from the Alaska-like temperatures and landscape of this desolate part of the world in Korea. And what he thought was happening was he thought that it was the unfolding of the final moments of a great victory march north that had begun with the amphibious Incheon landing behind North Korean lines. And that landing had been a great success. It was perhaps the greatest triumph of his storied career, and all the more so because he had pulled it off against the very heated opposition of most of Washington. And back in Washington, most of the senior people, both civilian and military, were becoming more and more uneasy as MacArthur, MacArthur pushed farther and farther north. And for as bad as they were doing on the defense, this is the U.S. I'm talking about and UN and South Korean Army, as bad as they were doing on the defense earlier in the, in the last episode when they initially got attacked and how they got completely overwhelmed, it was to that degree that they were now the overwhelming and invading army. The tables had entirely flipped over in the U.N. and U.S. favor. The North Korean resistance was essentially vanishing. But at the same time, the Chinese were warning that they were going to enter the war. And MacArthur, who was difficult to deal with under even the best of circumstances, was becoming even more godlike in the eyes of Washington and his men because of the Inchon landings. 
He just simply said the Chinese would not enter the war, and he liked to think of himself as an expert on what he called, quote, the Oriental mind. And although he was a expert of that Oriental mind, he had been wrong before, completely wrong, in fact, on the Japanese intentions and their abilities right before World War II. And looking back on the moments that escalated this war into a much larger one, many of the senior people in Washington would look at this very moment in Pyongyang and before the United States advanced to Unsan as the last chance to keep the war from escalating into something much larger, which was a war with China. And it was a chance that they, looking back on, knew was their last chance to keep that from happening. It was a chance that they missed. And the fact that they missed that chance is, it's disgusting when you learn and you know what they actually did to suppress all the intelligence and info that they had in front of them in order to make that mistake. There's a story of the first Chinese attack, which happened on the, I believe it was the 8th Cavalry or 1st first, first Cavalry Division in the 8th Army, but they attacked and they took a prisoner and the leader of that army group could speak Chinese. And he interrogated this prisoner who straight up told him, I am from China. I am not Korean. I'm Chinese. I've fought in this and that. He gave him all the information. And oftentimes these prisoners, these Chinese prisoners that they would take, they would spill their guts out with info because they didn't want to be fighting for the Chinese army in Korea. They didn't want to fight against the Americans, which they had just watched liberate China from Japan in World War II and essentially pull off one of the most impressive military feats in history with the dual theater front of World War II. So when they got captured, they weren't exactly difficult prisoners to get information from. This commander that could speak Chinese was named Pike, P-A-I-K, and he would interrogate these prisoners in Chinese and was sure that his force was soon to be overrun. The information that Pike got from that captured Chinese prisoner went all the way up into the new intelligence headquarters of the 8th Army, and it was sent to Brigadier General Charles Wilby. He was Douglas MacArthur's key intelligence chief, which means he was a man dedicated to the proposition from the get-go that there were no Chinese men in Korea. Essentially, that was what his commander believed, and MacArthur's headquarters was the kind where his intel officer's job was first and foremost to prove that the commander was always right. And so, MacArthur had his troops and his army groups spread so thinly over this vast expanse of mountain range in Korea solely because he was relying on the premise that there was an abstinence of Chinese presence there. So when these first reports about Chinese forces that had been massing north, north pardon me, of the Yalu River were coming in, Willoughby was very dismissive. He reported that they were, quote, probably in the category of diplomatic blackmail. And now with the first Chinese prisoner captured, the word would come back from Willoughby's headquarters that the prisoner was a Korean resident of China who had volunteered to fight. And it was instances like these where information was blatantly ignored and changed in order to fit a narrative for a higher-up commander simply because that's what he wanted to have happen. So in the coming weeks, the American or Republic of Korea, South Korean Army, the forces would take Chinese prisoners often who identified their units, confirmed that they had crossed the Yalu River, which is the river bordering on Manchuria and Korea, with large numbers. Again and again, Willoughby would downplay the field intelligence. And so, for the time being, the only people who really knew the truth that the Chinese had entered the war and in force were the men on the ground. The first of these attacks came near the North Korean city of Unsan, which is in the north part of North Korea. And one of the very first people to sense the danger was a young corporal named Lester Urban. And Corporal Urban was a man who had already been through his own prolonged hell. He had been captured by the Japanese at the Bataan, the Battle of Bataan, at the start of World War II, and he had managed to survive the Bataan Death March in more than three years as a prisoner. And his experience on Bataan made him less trusting of conventional wisdom, and he knew more about the consequences of 
He simply thought that the state of the Americans at that time in that location, he thought it was amateur hour. He said, quote, the North Koreans were driving good tanks, Russian A-34s, and the sorry old World War II bazookas the Americans had couldn't penetrate their skins. In World War II, you always knew what your objective was and who was fighting on your left and right. In Korea, you were always fighting blind and you were never sure of your flanks, because likely as not, the ROKs were there. And the ROKs, the Republic of Korea, the South Korean army, that were notorious for immediately retreating in chaos. So if an ROK unit was on your flank, you knew in the back of your mind, you had no flank protection. It sounds like a special kind of hell to have to go through combat, but then also to have to go through combat with this nagging thought in the back of your mind that all the enemy has to do is a simple flanking move and they've got you. And like I said earlier, the army groups and these battalions and divisions had been positioned as though there were no enemy to worry about. And that was really the biggest issue that caused such a cataclysmic chain of events for the United States when the Chinese entered the war. Lieutenant Hewlett Rainier said, quote, that you could drive a division or maybe two divisions of Chinese soldiers through them, talking about the United States army groups, and the people spending the night there might not even know it. And that was the way the enemy fought. He came up and moved along the flanks, then encircled you, and then squeezed you. I know regiment hadn't gotten the word from higher headquarters about the Chinese, but still, they were very far north. It was Indian country. Something was clearly up, and there was no point at all in being positioned as if you're back in the States on some kind of war game. To say it was careless was an understatement. You don't often find accounts from soldiers so highly critical of the actions of the commanders looking back on it some years later. With Korea, that's about all you can find. Even with Vietnam, where the situation was tragically similar, it holds Vietnam holds no candle to the amount of criticism and lament that these men had when looking back on the actions and movements of the time. It's truly a unique aspect of the Korean War of how critical it was looking back on it. And it's unfortunate because it should have served as a warning sign to Vietnam. And one of these men who looked back on this experience with a highly critical attitude was Major General Hap Gay. He was the 1st Cavalry Division's commander. And for some time, he had been disturbed by the way his division was being split up with different battalions being shipped off to other divisions based on what he felt like were just the whims of the people at the headquarters and not on the integrity of the division itself. Major General Hap Gay, he was George Patton's chief of staff in World War II, so to say he knew something about leading an army group would be an understatement, and he believed that he had been taught how to do things right and how not to do things wrong, and in Korea they had been doing, in his view, everything wrong from the get-go. He had been shocked by the terrible state of the army when the war began, as well as by MacArthur's initial failure to respect the ability of the enemy. And perhaps it's fitting that we did a little bit of a highlight on General Patton in the Bulge episode just two episodes ago, because you can tell with the language in the quote from Major General Gay that he was absolutely a student of Patton when he said about the headquarters, quote, those goddamn people don't have their feet on the ground. They're living in a goddamn dream world. And nothing angered him more than the way that the most talented officers, the kind of men he badly wanted as commanders, they always seemed to be siphoned off to the staff jobs at MacArthur's headquarters. For the moment, his larger concern was that his army was under threat of being encircled if they received an attack. So he went to his superiors and pushed hard for it to pull back and consolidate the division. But his superior, which was the 1st Corps commander, Frank Milburn, was very reluctant to do it. Simply put, the army just didn't like to use the word retreat, especially under MacArthur's command, because it just didn't send the right message. And Milburn was reluctant to do it. He didn't want to do it certainly after almost six weeks of steady advances, and above all, the mounting pressure coming in from MacArthur's headquarters to go all the way to the Yalu River as quickly as possible. So Major General Hap Gay was becoming more and more fearful about losing an entire regiment to an enemy that Tokyo still insisted did not exist, despite the proof 
slapping them in the face saying otherwise. It was like on one side was the battlefield reality and the dangers facing the troops themselves, and on the other side, this world of illusion that existed in the headquarters in Tokyo from which all of these euphoric riddled orders would emanate. And on the afternoon of November 1st, Hap Gay was in his command post with Brigadier General Charles Palmer, and they heard a radio report from a spotter plane that caught their attention. The report said, quote, This is the strangest sight I have ever seen. There are two large columns of enemy infantry moving southeast all over the trails in the vicinity of Myeongdang Dong and Yonghung Dong. Again, I apologize for my horrible pronunciation, I'm sure, but he continued, quote, Our shells are landing right in their columns and they keep coming. And General Hapgay nervously called the 1st Corps commander, once again requesting permission to pull the entire 8th Cavalry several miles south of Unsan, and his request was again denied. Subsequently, they would be attacked by two whole divisions of elite Chinese communist regular soldiers, and they were about to strike the units of an elite American division, pardon me, that was ill-prepared and ill-positioned for the attack. Even if it had been, it was commanded largely by men who believed that the Korean War was already over. And in a glaring example of refusing to admit enemy strength in Korea, not being enough of a foreshadowing warning to show the dangers of making this mistake again, it's unfortunate that this was done to a larger degree in Vietnam. This is the story of the 8th Cavalry, essentially their entire destruction from the Chinese forces that were about to attack them. An exceptionally careful historian of the Korean War named Roy Appleman pointed out that by nightfall of November 1st, the 8th Cavalry was encircled on three sides by the Chinese forces. Only on its east, if the 15th Republic of Korean South Korean Army had stayed in place and fought, would it have any protection whatsoever. So essentially, they were surrounded before they even knew it. And just to highlight the horrible nature of the attack that was about to unfold, in the 8th Cavalry, the 1st Battalion of that cavalry, which had a little over 400 men, which by the way, 265 of those, four, little over 400, were listed as casualties almost immediately when the attack began. But this 1st Battalion alone had five Medal of Honor recipients for their actions during this Battle of Unsan. Now that is a astonishing amount of Medal of Honors just from one battalion in one battle. And the reason I bring that up is because I want to make sure it's understood that this was, even though this somehow became the Forgotten War, this was a very real war with some horrible fighting. There is no such thing as combat and war that is anything less than truly horrific in its nature for the men fighting it on the ground. This war was no different. Lieutenant Ben Boyd was a new commander of one of the battalions in the 8th Cavalry. The only warning he got that they were about to receive a massive attack was one from his commander that said, quote, There are 20,000 laundrymen in the area. And he knew what that meant, that there were 20,000 Chinese about to come on top of them. And Lieutenant Boyd remembers suddenly hearing musical instruments, like weird Asian bagpipes, he called them. But it wasn't bagpipes. It was a very eerie, foreign sound, kind of like a bugle mixed with a flute that they would all remember for the rest of their lives. It was the sound they would quickly come to recognize as the Chinese about to enter battle. And they would use these instruments to signal to one another about what they were doing, and it would also very deliberately strike fear into the enemy they were attacking. And that attack would come at roughly 10.30 p.m. Boyd remembers being stunned at how quickly something could fall apart. The American units were positioned so thinly that the Chinese, as Boyd remembers it, seemed to race right through the lines, almost like a track meet, a lot of the men would later say about it. The entire battalion only had two tanks. The tanks were leading the convoy of retreat, which was about to walk right into a formidable Chinese ambush. 
Lieutenant Boyd remembers the convoy got about five or 600 yards down the road before the Chinese opened up their ambush. Their fire was overwhelming, and the convoy, with so many wounded already, had almost no way to fight back. In the confusion, the driver of Boyd's tank panicked and began to rotate his turret wildly, which knocked all the men, the dozen or so men, off off the tank that were on it, and Boyd remembers finding himself sprawled out in a ditch. And he could hear the Chinese approaching, and his only chance was to play dead. So they started beating on him with their rifle butts and kicking them, finally rummaging through his pockets, took his watch and his ring, and they left. He remembers waiting for what seemed like an eternity, and then he slowly started to crawl away, completely disoriented, suffering from a concussion among many other wounds. He would be out there alone for at least a week, maybe 10 days, trying to work his way back to American lines. And around November 15th, after a trek of almost two weeks, he would reach an American unit. And he had no idea how many of his platoon had died, but he noted that he never saw a single man from his platoon ever again. And that was the kind of attack that the Chinese would launch. This massive, overwhelming barrage of artillery, followed by a humongous wave of infantry that almost was like trying to stop water from falling on your head in a shower. It just, there was no way to stop it from happening. And it would completely overwhelm the out of position and thinly manned divisions of the American army. All of this could have been prevented if the higher ups and MacArthur simply let their ego take the back seat to the truth. Elsewhere at battalion headquarters of the 8th Cavalry, what Lieutenant Keyes remembers about the battalion command was that it was a total disaster. It was a scene that was filled with dazed men, wounded men, and they were completely numbed by what had happened. And they were just straggling in from different positions. When another man named Richardson reached it, he was shocked by the sheer chaos he found. He remembers Americans mixed in with Chinese soldiers at the battalion command, and these Chinese soldiers seemed unable to comprehend their swift victory as if they had succeeded beyond their own expectations. And now having taken the command post, it was as if they had no idea what to do next. You could pass a Chinese soldier right in front of the CP at that moment, and he wouldn't have done a thing. And what a odd scene of war. And it was in that odd scene of war that Lieutenant Keyes remembers hearing another Lieutenant, Frederick Giro, wounded, still functioning, giving a report. And he said that the attack had been, quote, just awful. The Chinese swept right through us. Only 25 of the company's 180 men are left. Only 25 of 180 men left in the company. And at that, it happened so fast that no one knew what was going on. Many of the men that were in that battalion command remember thinking that the Chinese were probably just as confused as the Americans on that first night. But a man named Richardson remembers that the confusion that they could tell from the Chinese, especially in that story of the command post, it didn't last into that second day of the Battle of Unsan. So when the reports of the Chinese overwhelming attack had reached the higher-ups in Tokyo, First Lieutenant Phil Peterson remembers 50 years later, and he says it's stuck in his brain as if it was etched in stone, the quote that they received from the battalion headquarters in Tokyo explaining the presence of the Chinese there. He said the report said, quote, it is assumed that the Chinese are here to protect the North Korean electrical generators up along the Yalu River, and you are not to fire on them unless they fire on you. No forward observer is to call in any fire on any electrical installation. And First Lieutenant Phil Peterson says, quote, What they gave us was a cover story. There are some parts of history that are just simply awful to learn about and awful to study. And this is absolutely one of them. Because of all this and everything that happened during this war, it was as if it had never happened and everyone wiped it from their memory just 12 years later in Vietnam. And I know I'm beating that point to the point of me beating a dead horse, but it's tragic. It is a truly horrific tragedy 
in our nation's history. And although this is not a fun part of history to learn about, it's imperative to understand it because we can keep something like this from happening again, where one company that had 180 men in it at the start left with only six survivors. And that was just the first day. 19-year-old Ray Davis, who was a corporal in Dog Company of the 1st Battalion, which was a heavy weapons company and he was a machine gunner, he remembered that that first initial hit wasn't even the real attack. He said that the real hit came a day and a half later. Now keep in mind in the last episode, I, I briefly talked about the strategy that the North Korean army would use in these attacks, and it was just throwing a wave of bodies of infantry at the front lines which happened to work because of the unprepared nature of those front lines. And for the last four months, Ray Davis was in battles where they were always heavily outnumbered, and the biggest problem he had in his machine gun squad was that their machine guns tended to wear out from heavy use. It, just to pause, they were melting the barrels of their machine guns because of how often they had to use them. Davis remembers, though, when the Chinese really attacked, he had never seen anything like that. He remembered at night, the American artillery would send up a flare for light, and it reminded Davis of growing up on a farm in upstate New York, because what he saw in front of him when that flare lit up was so many enemy soldiers that it reminded him only of the wheat waving in a field back home. He said it was a terrifying sight. Thousands and thousands of men seemed to hit him all at that same moment, coming directly for him. The Americans and Davis would fire and fire and fire, often at point-blank range, piling bodies up in front of them before they realized very quickly that they were completely surrounded. When the Battle of Unsan was over, just a few days later, on the morning of November 5th, there were some 800 casualties listed among the 2,400 men of the regiment. In the unfortunate 3rd Battalion, which was 800 men strong when the battle began, only an estimated 200 made it out. It was the worst defeat of the Korean War so far, and it was doubly painful because it had taken place after four months of battle when it seemed as though the tide had finally turned towards the Americans and the victory was in sight. To make matters worse, this loss was inflicted on a very highly admired and respected American unit. The men that were commanding on the ground quickly reacted and pulled all the UN and US forces into more fortified positions, moving back on the other side of the Chongchon River. They were preparing for another hit by these Chinese forces, but suddenly they vanished. As mysteriously as they had appeared, they were gone. They had quietly departed the battlefield and had become invisible just like they were before they attacked. And it was this that the men in Tokyo, in the headquarters, used to describe and explain their desire to say that they had left the battlefield entirely in order to fit their narrative. But what they were doing was actually moving into positions that were hidden much farther north in the mountains, where they would wait very patiently for the Americans to walk into a massive trap. One much farther from their main base, and what had happened at Unsan was just the beginning. The real hit would come much farther north in even colder weather about three weeks later. In what is a now horrible theme of this war and story, Unsan was a warning, and it was a warning that was ignored. And on November 3rd, just a few days before the end of the Battle of Unsan, the Joint Chiefs of Staff seeming to respond to President Truman's nervousness about what was going on, had sent a cable to General MacArthur asking him to respond to, quote, what appears to be an overt intervention in Korea by Chinese communist forces. And what followed in these next couple days would reflect the growing chasm between what MacArthur wanted to do, which was to drive north to the Yalu River and unify all of Korea, and the chasm between what Washington wanted to do which was just to avoid a major war with China. And so MacArthur decided to control the decision-making by controlling the intelligence. And in doing so, General Willoughby, 
was the key player. He deliberately minimized both the number and intentions of the Chinese troops. In a report on November 3rd, he placed the maximum number of Chinese present at 34,500. In reality, there were 300,000 men in 30 divisions already in the country. And if you think I'm being hard on MacArthur, I can assure you I am not. He received reports from all around Korea after this Battle of Unsan, like the report from General Walton Walker, the commander of the entire United States 8th Army, whose troops were the one hit at Unsan, and he had cabled back to Tokyo after the attack, said, quote, An ambush and surprise attack by fresh, well-organized, and well-trained units, some of which were Chinese Communist forces. And that cable was received by General MacArthur, and the candor of that message didn't exactly please MacArthur. So then MacArthur soon came down hard on Walker, who became increasingly nervous about moving north and reflected the desire of all the Joint Chiefs back in Washington in wanting to settle for a line at the neck of the peninsula instead of advancing farther. And in a move of ultimate pride, on November 6th, the day after the Unsan attack, General MacArthur issued a communique in Tokyo saying that the Korean War had been brought to a practical end by the way he had closed the trap north of Pyongyang. Him and Willoughby were about the only two people who actually believed that. The Joint Chiefs of Staff actually issued their own communique in stark contradiction to MacArthur's claim that the war was practically over, asserting that the Chinese intervention was a, quote, accomplished fact, which then MacArthur replied with another message, seeming to brush off their concern by saying that the Air Force could protect his men and his forces would be able to destroy an enemy in their way, and the drive north would continue. And with that choice, MacArthur chose to pursue his dream and to put his army at risk. It was a moment that was critical. Dean Acheson later wrote, The moment showed that extremely able troops from a brand new enemy had shown up on the battlefield, fought well, and then had seemingly, as a report said, quote, vanished from the earth. To make matters worse, at Sudong, on the other side of the peninsula, the Marines, who were part of the 10th Corps, had been hit very hard in a parallel battle that was from November 2nd to 4th, and lost 44 men killed and 162 wounded. Those Marines decided that the attack against them had been carefully calculated, as if the Chinese were baiting a trap for them, and they could not wait for them to push farther north and step even deeper into that trap. So this evidence of the Chinese at Sudong, coupled with the developments at the Battle of Unsan, made the situation much more serious, and made the Chinese presence a less isolated situation. It was the last chance to break off the drive north, to move back, and to avoid a larger war with the Chinese. But Washington notably did nothing. Dean Acheson noted in his memoirs, saying, quote, We sat around like paralyzed rabbits while MacArthur carried out this nightmare. To be fair, like I said, I'll call out fault when I see it, but I will, I will do that on both sides as much as I can. MacArthur did carry out this nightmare, but Dean Acheson and Harry Truman had ample opportunity to check his power up until this point. They gave him the power by continually allowing him to make these moves and decisions while going completely unchecked. So yes, it was MacArthur carrying out this nightmare, but he had been without resistance on his path to the power in order to carry out said nightmare. So yes, MacArthur is the one making the decisions, but Truman and Atchison, they're not free from blame here. It's a terrible mess of a situation. I suppose it's worth taking a moment to back up a bit and understand how China got to the point where they were essentially our ally just after World War II and during it, and now we're suddenly launching massive attacks against us. There were two different Chinas that existed back in that day, in 1950. There was a China that existed in the minds of millions of Americans, especially those in Washington, controlling the newly liberated country and propping up a leader of a giant country in which they knew nothing about. And there was a China that existed in reality, which was a feudal country 
that was horribly fragmented politically and geographically. It was a country of almost unbearable poverty, and it was ruled more often than not by regional warlords who were exceptionally cruel. It was a country of 500 million people governed by a shaky, corrupt national administration, foreign interests, and an infinite number of warlords that doubled as a government. It was a country that had been torn apart by more than two decades of on-and-off civil war and by the brutality inflicted on its people during the Japanese occupation. It was a China burdened, now with a badly flawed leadership under Chiang Kai-shek, and it was hardly a leadership equal to the task of a Herculean-sized challenge that was caused by such severe external and internal problems. It was, in historic terms to say the least, ripe for the picking. And the Communist Party was fully intent on picking the leadership for themselves. And if we fast forward back to where we were before we took that little detour in the story, there was now a mounting and growing uneasiness in Washington, first among the civilian leaders and then quickly among the military as well, as MacArthur began to stretch his orders in the march northward was accompanied first by threats from the Chinese that they were going to enter the war, and then by the subsequent appearance of the Chinese. And perhaps the best way to put into words the situation of General MacArthur in the army at that moment are the words from his most sympathetic biographer named Clayton James. And he wrote, quote, Had Napoleon Bonaparte examined MacArthur's career up to the eve of the Korean War, he undoubtedly would have concluded that he passed the first and foremost test of a commander. He was lucky. After Inchon, that luck finally ran out. And if that is the take from a sympathetic biographer for a person, you can imagine the reality of the situation and how much worse it really was. And the luck ran out when the Chinese decided to send their troops to Korea because Mao Zedong believed it was good for New China and necessary for the future of a revolution both domestically and internationally, which is a point that there was not a single American aware of other than George Marshall after World War II and his occupation. But it was a glaring example of why it is important to understand the people in the land of a nation that you're dealing with. But he... And the Chinese forces built up a force that numbered 36 divisions, or roughly some 700,000 troops, seven artillery divisions, and a number of anti-aircraft units eventually attached to that. Those 700,000 troops marked the decline of General Douglas MacArthur's storied career. And they may as well have marked the decline of American and United Nation involvement in Korea as well. And one notable point about this war in the history, historians studying it, is the confusion as to why China entered the war. Simply put, there's not an easy way to describe why, but essentially Mao Zedong, the leader, or Mao Zedong, he was the leader of the Communist Party in China, essentially the premier of China. And his decision to enter the war was not really an easy one. But the fateful decision for him, it was always kind of clear that China had to enter the war. And one of the most simple answers as to why was because of the island of Taiwan. To Mao and others in the Chinese leadership, the island of Taiwan had always been a part of China. And now they were listening to MacArthur publicly referring to it as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, which made it de facto American property. So to Mao Zedong, that meant that a legitimate part of Chinese territory was seen by his sworn enemy as a weapon aimed against his very own country. So for him, the way he saw it, it meant that the last battle of the great Chinese civil war had not yet been fought. And that was something that almost no Americans in power understood. But for the moment, he had no real means to make a move against Taiwan and reclaim it, He just simply didn't have the air or naval strength to do so. And that made Korea all the more attractive. He knew that in Korea, the confrontation against the American forces favored the Chinese from a logistical standpoint. 
He knew that even though they had a base of surplus and supplies in Japan, the American troops pushing north were going to be strung out, would be extremely difficult to resupply, and very vulnerable because of the nature of the terrain and weather. He knew he could easily put into play an army four times as large as that of the American force there, and he was sure his troops would fight bravely and with great discipline, as they did. And just like in Vietnam, Mao preferred to strike when the United States troops were at their most exposed and vulnerable, that is to say, they chose the time and place of the attack. It was exactly what the Vietnamese did, and they took a page right out of the playbook from Chinese warfare in Korea. This whole scenario is such a tragedy in our history, but it's one that's vital to understand. The author David Halberstam, who wrote one of the greatest books on the Korean War called The Coldest Winter, it is not a light reading, it's about 700 pages long, but he wrote a a good passage that I'm going to quote for you here, describing this entire situation. He says, quote, of the American military miscalculations of the 20th century, Douglas MacArthur's decisions to send his troops all the way to the Yalu River stands alone. And he points out that Vietnam was more of a political miscalculation and the chief architects of it were civilians, which is true. He continues, quote, all sorts of red flags were there for him, flags that he chose not to see. So it was that his troops, their command split, their communications often dangerously weak, the weather worsening by the day pushed north while the Chinese watched and patiently waited for them on the high hills already preparing to block the narrow arteries of retreat or escape. The same general who wanted to land at Inchon because it might end the war quickly and spare his troops from fighting in the cruel Korean winter was now ready to send them farther north, just as the Manchurian winter arrived. And in a typical Halberstam way, the very next passage is a quote from a man named Matt Ridgway, who said nearly 40 years after the war, quote, One of the things I found hardest to understand and to forgive as a commander was how completely oblivious the Tokyo command was to the conditions under which our men would have to fight. It was an oblivious nature that cost the lives of thousands and thousands of men on the ground. And of all of these sins, which Douglas MacArthur was indeed guilty of, at that moment, which I mean, included pride and vanity, there was probably no greater sin than his complete underestimation of the enemy. He seemed to just not care at all how and why Mao had come to power and seemed to have very little interest in the forces that the Chinese Revolution had unleashed. He showed an astonishing lack of curiosity about who his enemy was and why they had been successful in the past. So not only did he just purposely ignore information, but with a wealth of information available, he didn't even know who the Chinese commander in the field was. He had a belief that he didn't need to worry about the Chinese forces because of the supremacy of American air power. And it was a miscalculation that would haunt, if not himself, certainly the men who were fighting underneath him. And what is... Probably the most simple takeaway is that he had been blinded by his own success with the way that he used air power in World War II. At the headquarters in Tokyo, there was simply almost zero firsthand sense of the battlefield among anyone there. A pilot that was often in the headquarters and around Douglas MacArthur quite often said, quote, One of the great myths of the Korean War was Douglas MacArthur's claimed knowledge of the Oriental mind. We may have known the rich businessmen in Manila and the cowardly and corrupt Chinese leader in Chiang Kai-shek's army and the condescending Japanese in Tokyo, but we knew nothing about the battle-hardened North Koreans or the dedicated Chinese who had whipped Chiang Kai-shek. It was a classic failure to apply the most basic tenet for military commanders, which is to know your enemy. End quote. And the last point that I will make here is that not only did he not know much about the Oriental mind, MacArthur, but he didn't even really know that much about Asia. He had not been on Asian mainland since 1905. He paid, obviously, very little attention to the events that he didn't like, 
and to the degree that he knew any Asian country well at all, it was the Philippines, which was a nation, and still is a nation, that is as different from most other Asian countries as New York is as different from Texas. But during that World War II era, in the Philippines, he was something of a national hero. He was exceptionally well-connected with the upper class, and he was very, very well-rewarded for his role in the defense and reconquering of the Philippines. In fact, he and many key members of his staff, they received immense payments in early 1942 from the Philippine leader Manuel Quezon to guarantee their role as influential friends of Manila. And even before he departed the islands for Australia, as he left before the island was totally overrun, in one of the most bizarre financial arrangements of the Second World War, Quezon had transferred $640,000 to MacArthur in order to make sure they didn't leave for good. I don't know the words to say about a man that is a military leader taking bribes like that and thinking that he has this grandiose, so much larger than what he actually did. It's, it's a truly puzzling piece of American history. And all of that, in short, can be surmised by essentially saying that although he was not the first general to do this, MacArthur believed that one war would be essentially the same as the next one. And he didn't understand that the Chinese were the least industrialized of all the major nations, and they understood their own vulnerabilities all too well and adjusted accordingly. They fought in a primitive way that reflected their industrial economy status. They had an amazing ability to shift a mind-bogglingly large amount of forces without any detection at all. They could move multiple divisions up to 15 miles at night ensuring that not even a single cigarette was being smoked, and then they would burrow into handmade caves during the day. It was an ability that caught MacArthur and his immediate staff completely by surprise. As MacArthur's troops continued their push northward towards the Yalu River, the Chinese were carefully preparing what would become, in effect, the largest ambush in the era of modern warfare. And what the Chinese now wanted was for MacArthur to move ever farther north, just as he was doing. And MacArthur couldn't have done this alone. It was his staff that was so much of an extension of his own ego, playing a critical role that made sure whatever MacArthur wanted was going to happen, and that anything that cast doubt on his preconceptions were minimized until it vanished. His staff, in the fall of 1950, had a universe that was the size of a the head of a pin. If MacArthur smiled, they smiled. If he frowned, they frowned. If things worked out well, it was because he was a great man. If not, it was always because of the sworn enemies in Washington. Historian William Stuck wrote a particularly apt phrase saying that he had completely surrounded himself with men who, quote, would not disturb the dream world of self-worship in which he chose to live. It was a self-idolization that in no small way ensured that as I sit here recording this audio now, the Korean Peninsula is divided into with a enslaved people in North Korea under a oppressive regime in a free democratic society in the South. Now, we can't know for sure how it would have turned out, but we do know for sure why it did turn out the way it did. And as I'm hinting, it was mostly the fault of MacArthur. And so it was after this battle of Unsan that the fateful moment had arrived, and which should have marked the point that the command in Tokyo, if anything, was more nervous than Washington because of its men and the risk that they were under. It represented the last real chance to re-examine the war before the full Chinese force attacked. So in a strictly military sense, MacArthur's troops were now crossing the failsafe point. And that Unsan battle and the assault on the 8th Cavalry Regiment marked not only a critical moment on the battlefield, but also a major defeat for Washington 
in its war against General MacArthur. Dean Acheson and General Omar Bradley would eventually write of how poorly the president's advisors had served Truman during that time. They had simply been intimidated by their commander in the field, despite their own feelings that they were losing control. Essentially, they allowed him to just keep going north, as long as he was successful, but not to get in a war with the Chinese. And so his last great offensive would proceed as planned. Much later, after the war, Bill McCaffrey, who was one of MacArthur's deputies, found himself with Swede Larson, who was an aide to Joe Collins and a longtime friend. And he asked Swede, he said, quote, For Christ's sake, Swede, what were you guys in Washington doing? Didn't anyone notice that we were spread out all over North Korea? Didn't anyone happen to notice it? And Larson answered with, quote, Bill, did you ever stop to think what it would be like to tell Douglas MacArthur that his strategic ideas are screwy after Inchon? It wasn't going to happen. And how can you argue with that? Do you think that you would be able to stand up to that, that much of a personality in that era where that was simply something you didn't do? As hard as I've been on MacArthur, it is important to take a step back and realize that this was a different era in which things hadn't come into fruition the way that they are today. And now you could hardly conceive of a general contradicting the orders of a president, but back then, it hadn't really been challenged yet. And so this is why we now have such a firm understanding of the president as the commander-in-chief, because we've learned from our mistakes in the past. And what all of that meant was the simple fact that MacArthur's men were moving north. Men like Captain Jim Hinton, leading his tank battalion, were going north. And Hinton thought, as they were moving north, that everything had just been too quiet. There had been a few small skirmishes, but they were always followed by silence. And silence had its own corollary of fear. It was an unnatural silence of complete isolation. You can liken it to silence, the deafening sound of silence. Hinton recalled, quote, We were more and more isolated, more and more cut off every day, therefore more and more vulnerable. Each day that we went out, we were more spread out and farther from other units. The isolation was from our own people, not just from other divisions supposedly on our flanks, but from the people in our own division from regiment to regiment, and in the regiment from battalion to battalion and company to company. We knew we were at someone else's mercy, that is, we had to hope the Chinese were not coming in. It was an eerie feeling. The terrain seemed to be swallowing us up. As a division, we seemed to be disappearing into the vast landscape itself. And just a little bit away from there was a man named Sam Mace. And later on in life, Mace would show his sense of humor about his past and noted that he was probably one of the foremost authorities on ambushes because he had been in three of the most spectacular ones in American history. The one that was coming up at the city of Kanuri was probably the granddaddy of them all, as far as ambushes, strictly, but he was also in a very famous ambush, which was the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And Mace, like many of the people, almost all of the men who survived the Battle of the Bulge, noted that the cold of that battle in the Ardennes Forest in Bastogne in Belgium had been unbearable. And Korea, during this time, he was often reminded of it because he had thought that that cold was the worst cold in the world. But Korea was worse than the Ardennes. He noted that it lasted longer and it dominated your life as the Ardennes cold never could. He said that in the Ardennes forest, you always believed that the cold would break in a day or so. In Korea, he never had that thought. In early November of 1950, moving forward on the front edge of the second division, the caution that Sam Mace had learned in the Ardennes forest remained with him. He distrusted every single thing that he could not vouch for personally and was very wary of his officers who seemed overly casual. And as he climbed over a small cluster of hills with his unit, he remembers hearing what he said was, quote, 
the strangest music I ever heard. It was so strange. It seemed to be aimed right at me and my men, like the enemy was watching us and serenading us and mocking us all at the same time. It was as it, it was as if, pardon me, the valley itself was serenading you, and it was coming out of nowhere. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand out. Later, they would all learn how the Chinese would use the music as the means of giving their orders in the battle, and Mace became entirely convinced that it was the Chinese commander somewhere in the hills high above him telling his troops that though they had his tanks and men surrounded, it just wasn't the right time to attack. And in fact, the Chinese had been waiting patiently, aware of every single move that the forces of their enemy were making, which units were positioned where, and above all, which Republic of Korean army units were supporting them on their flanks. And finally, it was on the night of November 25th that the Chinese finally made their attack. It is almost the only example in history of such a large force of 180,000 men in their army maintaining the element of surprise entirely against its adversary. The Chinese had precise intelligence on the Americans, and the Americans, on the other hand, were blind essentially entirely blind to the trap that they had just stumbled into. If it was a game of poker, they called MacArthur's bluff of the bet that he had made that the Chinese would not come in. And now, not MacArthur, but the men on the field were going to have to pay for the terrible arrogance and vainglorious tone of that bluff. And in one of the, again, what should have been the foreshadowing warning for us in Vietnam, the Chinese in the early days of the battle, before the Americans figured out how to fight them at all, had managed to turn what were supposedly the strengths of the American military, which were a dependency on heavy weapons and roadways because of it, they managed to turn those strengths into weaknesses. They understood that those roads in Korea were almost always in valleys. It was a perfect place to ambush them. And it was this ability of the Chinese army to launch a massive full frontal assault surprise attack and then suddenly vanish as if they had never been there before that invoked a special type of fear. One man named Butch Hamill would eventually write about the type of combat in Korea and saying that he believed that if there was any one great truth to combat like this, It was the constant presence of fear. Any man who says that he's not scared in combat is a liar. Every soldier in a situation like that faced a terrible choice. He said that you wanted nothing more than to live another day, nothing more than to bug out from where you were, but you also don't want to be seen as a coward. And only the dishonor of running and letting your buddies down would keep you from trying to slip away. And because of that, as Hamill thought, and only because of that, do you stay where you are and keep fighting. All that other stuff that they had been taught about fighting for their country and against the communist enemy, all of that disappeared and was replaced by a constant fear the moment the battle would start. And as someone who's never experienced battle myself, I don't know what it what kind of special hell it must be like to be in a constant state of mind numbing fear fear was certainly not in short supply that night on november 25th of 1950 when the chinese mounted their attack they attacked 3 battalions of american soldiers They were positioned just south of the Chongchon River, and they had fairly decent high ground. And under normal circumstances, they actually might have been okay. But this was anything but normal. Their flank was composed entirely of South Korean Republic of Korean Army soldiers. And that flank collapsed almost immediately, which left them completely defenseless against wave after wave of Chinese troops. In the battalion headquarters, men remember hearing the reports flooding in on the radio of, quote, They're hitting us. My God, they're everywhere. 
We're holding, but they're all over the place. Every time we stop them, more come. We can no longer hold. There are so many of them. This may be the last message you get from us. And in the history of military disasters that are terrible, they're at least momentary ones. Something horrendous will happen to a given unit that has been poorly positioned or led, and that individual unit will suffer badly, and then, with some luck, that's usually the end of it. Especially when considering the ability of the American army to move men around and protect those under attack. Take, for example, the Battle of the Bulge. It's a classic one. But this attack was different than any kind of disaster before it. Instead of getting better, it grew worse by the hour as if it had a life all of its own. The initial attack came through an area where one man had placed an outpost of three men, and those men were so surprised at the swiftness and the overall number of how many Chinese there were suddenly in front of them, they didn't even fire because they would have been killed instantly. So there were no warning shots heard for the rest of the battalions not far away at all. The Chinese overran their position so quickly it would make your head spin. But what was terrifying, all these men wrote later on, was not just the fact that so many Chinese were coming right at them, but that they could also hear the sound of so many others going right past them. And they knew that that sound of them moving past them meant that their escape routes from being captured or killed had just been cut off. And that was the real fear that they were experiencing at that moment, knowing that they were not only in a desperate situation, but a hopeless one. Two men named Jean Takashi and Sergeant First Class Arthur Lee, who happened to be a platoon sergeant and one of Takahashi, pardon me, it wasn't Takashi, it was Takahashi, it was one of his best men, and they were at the very initial point of the attack of the Chinese in their platoon, and they were handling machine guns in their defense. Takashi, Takahashi, pardon me, I don't know why I can't get his name right, Takahashi assumed that if he was going to be dying, taking on what appeared to be, to him, the entire Chinese army, he was glad it was next to Lee. And he remembers that they were nodding to each other, the nod seeming to acknowledge that they were aware they were both going to die up there on that hill, but at least they were going to die like soldiers. And he remembers they were trying to communicate when suddenly the only sound coming from Lee was a gurgle. He had been hit in the throat and was drowning in his own blood. They had no choice but to keep on fighting, and the Chinese made charge after charge, getting closer every single time until they finally pushed the American force off the hill. In that company, almost every single man was killed. They held out against unbelievable odds for several hours, but their company, Love Company, which had been a good unit the day before, was entirely gone. They were the point company for the entire 8th Army and had taken the full brunt of the Chinese attack, and that holding the Chinese off for the few hours they had was something of a miracle, and it was hardly less of a miracle that anyone at all made it out alive. And as one of the men named Raybold was retreating away as a survivor, one of the very few survivors of that battle in that company, the scene that he saw as he looked back was the scene of Chinese soldiers tackling the last remaining American men on that hill. Raybold and Takahashi and two or three other men found themselves behind Chinese lines, completely alone and unable to defend themselves. They moved cautiously and carefully only at night until finally Jean Takahashi bumped into American troops near Kunuri, Two days later, that was when he found out that the rest of his unit was almost entirely gone but him. It's one of the characteristics of this war and the type of combat they were going through specifically that showed the amazing thing about combat in general. And it was how it has this ability to strip men down to their essential elements. Some men would look strong and tough, and even more important, they would sound strong and tough. And as soon as combat 
leapt upon them, it all changed. Some of them, as they'd find out, weren't so tough at all. And by contrast, someone who was seen as scrawny and mild-mannered would turn out to actually be a very good soldier, strong on the inside instead of the outside. And there was no way to tell in advance who these truly brave men were. It's a puzzle that men who look back on their time in combat and war are never really able to solve because the answers are always so different from man to man. But it does go to show that outward force is not always reflective of a good soldier or a brave man. These were normal people in a green olive uniform with an American flag on their shoulders fighting for something they didn't understand why they were there for in the first place, and now suddenly they find themselves in the middle of a living nightmare. I think it's something I always tend to forget, that armies are made up of normal, regular people like you and myself. This isn't like Sparta, where you're born a soldier and brainwashed from an early age into believing that that's all you're there to do. These were people who owned bakeries and got drafted or signed up because they felt the call to duty, and then suddenly, just a few months later, they're staring headlong into 180,000 Chinese soldiers running right towards them. I can't even imagine what that must be like. That stark contrast of civilian life to war and finding out who the brave really are. It's a concept that I believe is captured a bit by our friend Sam Mace that we just heard about before from the Battle of the Bulge, he said that fear was the terrible secret of the battlefield, and it could afflict the brave as well as the timid. And what was worse is that it was contagious, and it could destroy a unit before the battle even began. And because of that, commanders were first and foremost in the fear suppression business. And it's not a facet of leadership that is solely characteristic of military or war, it translates to sports and all different types of leadership, but great commanders are men who aren't just gifted in making wise decisions or tactical moves, but they're also men who give out a sense of confidence that whatever the goal is can be done, and that it's their duty and their privilege, in this case, to fight on the given day that the battle happens. But what Sam Mace said about that initial Chinese attack was that even in his worst days during the Battle of the Bulge, when he shivered in the terrible cold in Bastogne and the Germans were pounding away with artillery, he had believed that someone was on the way. The commanders in the army and the military were so good back then, they were so efficient and powerful, that when things went wrong, they soon were going right. But now, in Korea... He didn't even have an inkling of that feeling in his current situation. And from then on, for the rest of his life, Sam Mace refused to speak of Douglas MacArthur by name. Instead, he simply called him in letters and articles for veterans groups and so on. And in conversation, he would only refer to him as, quote, the big ego. Leadership starts from the top and is transferred all the way down. And if it's not there at the top... It isn't there for any part of the army. Korea is a tragically clear example of how that takes place. And, true to form, in those first few days, General MacArthur's command was still trying to minimize the importance of what had happened. A full-scale retreat would shatter the last of his great dreams. One of MacArthur's Officers named Dick Raybould would say many years later of the chaos that hung over his division, he said, quote, We failed because we were set up to fail. But at this point, it seemed like the only people who were either purposely unaware or actually naive to the fact that there were Chinese in the war now and that this was a new player on the field were the people in command in Tokyo. Because even the journalists were aware that the Chinese had entered the war. Homer Bigart of the New York Herald Tribune, who ended up winning his second Pulitzer Prize for his Korean War reporting, wrote, quote, 
UN forces are now paying the initial price for the unsound decision to launch an offensive north of the peninsula's narrow neck. The move was unsound because it was undertaken with forces far too small to secure the long Korean frontier with China and Russia. Even without the open intervention of Red China, the UN army was too weak to justify scattered garrisons along the Yalu River. The overall picture is grim. Perhaps understanding a little bit about the number two man to General MacArthur can shed some light as to the total chaos and bedlam that was going on in the headquarters at the time. Major General Ned Almond, spelled just like the nut, was MacArthur's number two man. He viewed MacArthur as a demigod, and in his mind, MacArthur could do no wrong. He had a reputation among the men of being the last great World War I general. And if you know anything about World War I, you know that the initial fighting was the romance type of fighting that knights and, and chivalry is associated with and ornate uniforms, things like that. And it quickly, quickly changed into modern warfare. And the men called him the last great World War I general because his personal trailer was filled with comforts and amenities. Most important of them all was heat in a country where everyone else was super, super cold. Creature comforts were important to Allman, and he lived in a shockingly grand lifestyle. His trailer even had a bathtub, and there almost always seemed to be hot water. In addition, he also had a separate tent with a heater for his toilet. He always ate very well, had the best steaks flown in regularly from Tokyo, along with fresh vegetables and wine. And of course, all the other officers and troops resented him for it. But Almond was MacArthur's boy. He was a true loyalist, he was headstrong and arrogant, and he was determined to make the reality of the Korean battlefield fit the dreams of MacArthur. Basically, Almond was playing the middleman between MacArthur and the men as this self-important, really impatient middleman demanding that the men under him follow orders that were essentially conceived in madness. He ordered General O.P. Smith to take his men as fast as as he could, north towards the Yalu River, and Smith would systematically undermine his orders because he saw it as protecting the lives of his men. Almond ordered Smith's men into an area which his division was to operate and dominate the Chinese, which was a 1,000 square mile area filled with rugged mountains in freezing temperatures. And I've said freezing temperatures several times. I, th I think I should make a point to just say Temperatures in the in the mountains in the Chosen Reservoir and up towards the Yalu River where these men were fighting at this time were regularly 20 degrees below zero. Even the cold of Bastogne holds no candle to that kind of temperature. This was a devastating cold. And Major General O.P. Smith, his name was Oliver Prince Smith, was one of the greatest quiet heroes of the entire Korean War. He was a World War II veteran and was with the Marines when they landed on the island of Peleliu. If you don't know anything about that battle, it was horrific. You can watch the HBO miniseries The Pacific. They do a very good job of displaying the atrocity of it all. And atrocity might even be an understatement. It had ended up as one of the major disasters, if not the major disaster of the entire Second World War Pacific theater. Given his experience there... Smith did not intend to be the man who would lose the 1st Marine Division under his control to the Chinese in some frozen wasteland because he had blindly followed orders he believed had zero relation to the battlefield in front of him. In the Marine breakout, which was really a retreat from the Chosen Reservoir, which we're going to get into in a minute, was certainly one of the most, one of the greatest moments in the Marine Corps' history, and no small amount of credit for it was O.P. Smith and for what he did not do more than what he did do. The day that they were supposed to kick off their big drive north was November 27th. Smith had been assured by command in Tokyo that the Chinese could not move through these allegedly impenetrable mountains to his west. He didn't really care because he didn't think his troops should be operating there in the first place. After the battle was over, he said, quote, the country around Chosin was never intended for military operations. Even Genghis Khan wouldn't tackle it. But 
Smith had his orders to push forward, and he had no other choice but to push forward. And those Chinese that Smith had been assured couldn't get through those mountains had managed to get through those impenetrable mountains, amassing a 250,000-man front against 130,000 on the Western Front and 150,000 Chinese soldiers against 100,000 Yuan troops on the Eastern Front. And they were now on the south side of the Yalu River in Korea, very well hidden away in the caves. What Smith was really worried about, though, was the terrain and the weather. He said, quote, I believe a winter campaign in the mountains of Korea is too much to ask of an American soldier or Marine, and I doubt the feasibility of supplying troops in this area during the winter or providing for the evacuation of sick and wounded. But his complaints fell on deaf ears. One day, General Almond had asked another General Harris what he was looking for. Harris had answered that it was a small airstrip so that they could land enough supplies and transports to bring in more supplies and to carry out the casualties. Allman then shot back, quote, what casualties? Harris said of Almond, quote, that's the kind of thing you are up against. He wouldn't even admit that there would even be casualties. He later told that story to Bemis Frank, who was a Marine Corps historian, and he finished his quote with, we took 4,500 casualties out of that field. So you have your general in command of this army group refusing to even admit that there will be casualties, and then it turns out they got shellacked with 4,500 of them. I mean, what, what a wild dichotomy to be trying to operate an army under. What was really troubling for the Marines up there was the road systems. Just north of the cities of towns, really, of Sudong and Katori, the road became more and more difficult the farther they went. It elevated at an accelerating rate, and it was 2,500 feet just in eight miles. And it was a terrifying stretch known as the Funchilin Pass. Matt Ridgway wrote about it and said, quote, A narrowing, frightening shelf with an impassable cliff on one side and a chasm on the other. At one very critical point in the pass, the only way to keep going north was over a concrete bridge that covered four gigantic pipes, which pumped water from the chosen reservoir to a power plant. And what General O.P. Smith realized was that the bridge was intact. It hadn't been blown up, and he smelled a trap right away. But Smith had his orders to go north, and go north he would. And given the thinness of the American forces and the absolute harshness of the terrain, some of those mountains were 7,000 feet tall, and like I mentioned, the cruelty of how cold it was, it was an order of pure insanity. The people in the headquarters in Tokyo simply did not understand that those orders would result in being cut off from the UN forces themselves, and it would make them completely isolated in the most unreachable place in the country. Even in the unlikely event that the Marines with all their vehicles actually tried to make it all the way north to the town of Mupyongi, I think is how it's pronounced, it would turn out to be just an ox trail that they were supposed to go on. And of course, it would be ice covered and over mountainous peaks and they would be a sitting duck for the Chinese army. But for MacArthur, this link-up of the 10th Corps and the 8th Army at Mupyongi was a symbol of the victory and the crowning moment of a career-crowning campaign. It would be proof to him that he had conquered the country and the enemy, and he didn't care and ordered them on. It was delusions of grandeur. When the Marines were hit by an attacking force of two entire Chinese divisions— General Almond replied with, quote, That's impossible. There aren't even two Chinese divisions in all of North Korea. We're still attacking. We're going all the way to the Yalu. Don't let a bunch of goddamn Chinese laundrymen stop you. And it was orders like that that they had to try to come to terms with and figure out a way around them. Orders of pure insanity. And finally, General Almond was recalled to Tokyo headquarters for a war meeting of the principal commanders of the war. And true to character, and it reminds me quite a bit of General Bernard Montgomery and Charles de Gaulle and their actions during World War II, on the afternoon of November 28th, General Douglas MacArthur sent the Joint Chiefs a message. He said that they now faced a, quote, entirely new war, and 
this command has done everything humanly possible within its capabilities, but is now faced with conditions beyond its control and its strength. But do not miss the important, critical point of this story, where we now have the man who caused all of this, ignored the warning signs, ignored the intel. He was already pulling back from any responsibility for the catastrophe that was unfolding in front of him. He blamed it first on fate, and then, when that didn't work, the civilians in Washington. And if you're looking for the definition of a coward, that would be it. During that meeting, it lasted about four hours, MacArthur did most of the talking. He seemed to think that only six Chinese divisions or some 60,000 men were engaged with the 10th Corps Marines. The more realistic number was 12 divisions and about 120,000 men. Finally, the word and order to pull back came from headquarters on November 29th, extremely late in the battle, during which each day and hour passed had worked for the Chinese and against, in particular, the 2nd Infantry Division, but all of the UN and U.S. forces. And David Halberstam makes a note of this meeting, saying, quote, If there was one symbolic moment that reflected how disconnected the headquarters was from the battlefield, it took place at that meeting, when Pinky Wright, who was the acting G3 for MacArthur, suggested in the midst of that crisis that the American Army's 3rd Division set out across the Tabex and link up with Walker's force. It was a truly astonishing, astonishing pardon me, suggestion. A senior in ROTC at an American high school might well have come up with a better idea. That, even Almond noted, simply could not be done. There were no roads going west. Any American unit trying to cross on whatever trails existed would be easy prey for the Chinese. If you are trying to lead an army in a country that you are not in, you will not be successful. You have to understand what it is like on the ground. And perhaps that was MacArthur's first big mistake, was that he never spent a night in Korea, and he never led from the battlefield. Now remember, that pass, that treacherous pass, was the road that they had to retreat out from. It was chaos to say the least. By the time the retreat had just barely begun, the road was already littered with dead bodies and disabled vehicles. Now, Corporal Hinton and Sam Mace are still part of this story. Hinton was Mace's commanding officer, and he decided to use Sam Mace to lead the convoy. He always considered Mace was his best man, so he ordered Mace to take his five tanks and clear the road south to Sun Chan. They started out, Mace up front, and Hinton in a jeep, two or three vehicles back, followed by more tanks and infantry loaded up on deuce-and-a-half trucks. They had gone several hundred yards when the Chinese began opening up from both sides of the mountains down on the valley where the road was in. Mace's five tanks were to lead a convoy interspersed with trucks and some infantry riding on top of the tanks to help control the road and suppress the Chinese fire coming from the high ground. This road was a slow and wildly dangerous start-and-stop process of letting the infantry off the tanks and then firing back to suppress the Chinese fire. Mace remembered having a profound sense of foreboding that he and his men had somehow become major players in a play that was scripted by the enemy. Any sense of orderly retreat and an orderly convoy had gone out the window. In the army, structure was believed to be everything— And on that day, the structure had simply vanished. And once it was gone, it was very hard to get back. And imagine what this scenario was like. A vehicle would get hit, and it would block the road for the others. Then some brave soul would try to move it aside, all the while taking massive amounts of fire from the Chinese. Bodies would lay right in the middle of the road. Some might be still alive, for all anyone knew. And the driver of the next truck or jeep would have no choice in that narrow passage, but to run right over them. This is a road of nightmares. The men themselves, more often than not, seem to be numbed by it at that point. Some of them just huddle alongside the road, and sometimes it was hard for the man Jones driving one of the jeeps to tell who was dead and wounded, and who was simply paralyzed. He said it was like men whose bodies still functioned, but whose spirits were broken. At the most, 
dangerous part of this pass and this road for the retreat, it was donned the nickname The Gauntlet. And when Jean Takahashi from earlier, finally said his name right, when he finally made it through The Gauntlet, he was stunned by what had happened to his company, his battalion, and regiment. He knew it was bad, but it had been so much worse than he realized. Love Company was down to about a dozen men. As far as he could tell, he was the only officer left, and all the others had either been killed, seriously wounded, or were MIA. A couple days later, when they finally got to assemble, only 10 men of the original 170 of Love Company were there. Of the 600 men in Takahashi's battalion, only 125 made it through. As combat units, Love and King companies, they had been on point for the division when the Chinese assault began. They essentially no longer existed at all. The battle for the Chosen Reservoir was a disaster, and it was a disaster that could have been avoided, much like this entire war. But with the current commander of this army and this war, it didn't look like things were going to get any better. After the Battle of the Chosin, the United States had to regroup. And they would regroup in a more than just a military sense. They would regroup politically, they would regroup culturally, and they would regroup militarily and figure out just what in the hell had gone on and how to deal with this problem of the Chinese before it got any worse. That is, before General MacArthur made the problem any worse. podcastadvocate.network.